Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Julie Sullivan, president of the University of St. Thomas, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this first Friday luncheon. Uh, we are particularly um, grateful to welcome our alumni back to campus. Uh, I had the opportunity to speak to the alumni board. I see Nancy out there. Uh, I think it was this week, I've lost track of time, but it was sometime recently. And uh, I really, really appreciate the uh, engagement of our alumni and the care our alumni have, uh, continuing care for the university and for our students. Um, I think you all know this has been a trying time at the university for the past two, two weeks in particular. Uh, we, we've been really saddened by the loss of two of our young students and we've been grieving that event and coming to terms with that event. Uh, as you also know, we had a hate crime committed on our campus about two weeks ago. We've also been grieving and hurt and coming to terms with that event. So while I say all of that, and while I'm tired at the moment, and all of my colleagues in this room are tired at the moment, I also want to share hope. Because I think all of my colleagues in this room feel the same hope as well. Uh, we feel this hope because we are seeing our community uniting around our values, uniting around the way we want to live as individuals and the way we want to live collectively as a community, and recognizing the hard work that it will take. We're uniting around our convictions, our convictions of diversity, of dignity, of personal attention, and of gratitude. And we're uniting around our individual responsibility to respect one another, appreciate one another, care for one another, celebrate one another, and seek strength from God, and give praise to God. So it has been a really tough time, but, and you know, when you're mourning census loss of young people, and trying to help their classmates come to terms with that. You know, it, it, you really have to come to God. Uh, but our, our um, and when you combat evils such as racism. But our community is getting stronger and will continue to get stronger and will continue to be the proud university uh, that you've known and uh, will continue to know. So thank you for being a part of us. Um, I know that we're here today to focus on Election Day, and uh, I can't believe it is next Tuesday. <laughs> I, many of you may have already voted, uh, but I hope many of you either have or will. I expect I should restate that. I hope all of you either have or will. Uh, but whether you have or you will, the this this purpose of this conversation is not to convince you about that, about how you would vote or how you have voted, it is to really analyze what kind of a provocative of what's the state of things, what might happen, and what does it mean, and what does it mean in a larger picture. So we have some great speakers uh, today, and uh, we're going to get to them after, after our meal. Um, and our students are really into the election this year. I wanted to share that with you because I've had questions from alumni. Uh, there's been a lot of get out the vote campaign. Our student affairs has arranged for transportation to students who particularly live on the south side of Summit and can't vote on campus but vote in another, uh, another location. Uh, we've ha had a number of candidates on campus campaigning uh, with our students. And uh, I think this is a really important time for us to help them realize how important it is that they carefully consider their own choices and, and get out to vote. So it's, it's somewhat energized. Um, I also want to remind you that just one week later from next Tuesday is Tommy Gibb Day, November 13th. That's a day when all alumni, faculty, and students are invited to participate in the university's fourth annual virtual fundraiser. Uh, this is a global display of the power of purple. You've probably seen us. We're out on social media. We're out on banners. We're out everywhere. 
uh, because what we're raising money for is scholarships, scholarships to support our students. And we want everyone to participate in that. And every gift, no matter what the size, is extremely appreciated and makes a difference in the life of our students. So to get you excited about that, you should find a pair of socks at your table. You see a pair of socks at your table? Uh, that's, again, about the power of purple. So let me tell you about the socks. The person at your table that is wearing the most purple gets the socks. So I'll let you determine who that is. Have a little fun with that. You can't cheat by putting your napkin in your... Uh... <laughs> okay, so hopefully you have determined the uh, new owner of the socks. And after our meal, you're going to hear from Tom Horner and Mary Lehammer. But at this time, I'd like to ask Father Larry Snyder, our Vice President for Mission, to lead us in prayer. All right. Good afternoon. And as we begin our prayer, I would first of all ask us to pause and to remember our two students who passed away, Katie Mullen, Joya Simpson, who left us very unexpectedly and far too soon. Let us remember their parents, their classmates, their families, and their friends at this time of great loss. We pray that Katie and Joya are at peace and are resting now in God's loving arms. Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, we give you thanks for your overflowing generosity to us. We thank you for our homes and families and friends. Thank you for our health, our work, and our play. We ask your blessing upon this university, its students, faculty, staff, and alumni, as it continues to educate and form students to be morally responsible leaders May it enrich students' lives and build up the common good. We are especially grateful for the friendship and presence of those who are gathered here today. We thank you for the blessings of the food we eat and for this meal that we share. We also ask you to be with those who are hungry, alone, sick, or suffering. Open our hearts to share your love with all those we meet. And we ask your blessing through Christ your Son. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, enjoy your meal. So good afternoon. I'm going to uh, interrupt your delicious meal and uh, your non-caloric chocolate cake. <laughs> so now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Tom Horner and Mary LaHammer. Tom is a 1972 St. Thomas alumnus who works in public affairs consulting. He was the independent party candidate in the 2010 Minnesota gubernatorial election, and he served as Senator Dave Durenberger's press secretary and chief of staff. He's joined here today with his wife, Libby, and with his daughter, Amanda, who is a double Tommy, undergraduate and master. So we're grateful to have you. And Mary, our other speaker, is a well-known political reporter for Twin Cities Public Television and is most recognized for her role on Almanac. She's had a, a lustrous career and uh, news broadcast and news journalism and political reporting, and we're really delighted to have her wisdom with us here today. And she also is joined by her husband, Chad Flynn, who is a Tommy from the class of 1993. So thank you for being with us, Chad. So now please join me in welcoming to the stage Tom and Mary.
Hello, hello, we're checking mics, and I'll tell a brief story because I, I do have to admit I'm a gopher. I am a U of M grad, but I kind of married into being a Tommy, and we were married at the St. Thomas Chapel, and some of you may know our officiant's father, John Malone. <laughs> See, you're laughing already. <laughs> Rightfully so, and it was co-officiated by Pastor General Senator Dean Johnson. If you know Dean, you know it may have been the most uproarious laughter ever heard in the St. Thomas Chapel. <laughs> and, and one other story, so my married name is technically, and don't repeat this or tweet it, but my husband's name is Chad Flynn, so my legal married name is actually Mary Kathleen Flynn. <laughs> I'm not Irish or Catholic, but somehow it sounds that way. <laughs> and the story, my, my husband was visiting me at the state capitol, where I've worked for many decades now. And on that particular day, Archbishop Flynn happened to be visiting the state capitol. My husband was <coughs> passing in front of the Senate chamber, and I wanted to get his attention. So I yelled, hey, Flynn! <laughs> 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 The archbishop walked right in front of me at that moment and shot me a dirty look like I've never seen in my life. I did a lot of explaining about the use of Flynn and screaming. but <laughs> So it's, it's great to be back on campus here. And the other part, so I kept my maiden name, Lahammer, because my father was a reporter before me. Tom and I both share a lot of family legacy in media in this market. My dad was a reporter for the Associated Press for 36 years in the state capitol. I fell in love with politics and journalism, chasing him around the state. And the one story I remember where it all crystallized and solidified, Governor Rudy Perpich at the time. Anybody remember Governor's nickname? You remember him? What was his nickname? Governor what? Governor Goofy, because he had all these goofy ideas like, let's build the largest mall in America in Minnesota. Everybody thought it was crazy. I think it might have worked, by might the way. Have Let's have a Super might Bowl. Everybody yeah. thought it was crazy. Yeah, we did that too. Let's invite Mikhail Gorbachev to Minnesota. <laughs> that happened too. Let's send high school students to college for free. Post Secondary Enrollment Options Act. Everybody thought that was crazy. That put me through school, and I ended up finishing two years of college while in high school because of Governor Goofy's crazy ideas. But uh, my dad brought me to work a lot. And one weekend, Governor Perpich was going to announce whether he was going to run for re-election or not. Capitol reporters work a lot of hours, long hours. It was a Sunday announcement up at Itasca State Park, the headwaters of the Mississippi, hours and hours and hours away. So I go up with my father, and he is using a lot of choice words, swearing, cursing, often in Norwegian, which helped at the time on the way up, so he was not happy to be working on a weekend. Governor Perpich took to the podium, read a 26 second statement, turned around, refused to take questions and left. <laughs> the entire <coughs> Capitol press corps was screaming, sprinting and swearing at the governor. And I thought, I'm in, I'm hooked. <laughs> That's what I wanna do for a living. <laughs> when, I, when, when I did my press conferences, the media would be leaving. I'd say, hey, I can stick around for a little bit longer. <laughs> What's your rush? <laughs> but it's true, ever since I could walk, talk, eat, breathe, I wanted to be a political reporter. And I wanted to be one in Minnesota, because I think our politics are the best and the most interesting in the country, and it's because of you. The show I work for, Almanac, the Friday Night Public Affairs show, has been on the air for 32 years. It's the longest running, highest rated public affairs show in the history of television. And we're not the reason. You're the reason because Minnesotans lead the nation in voter turnout. We lead the nation in education levels, SAT scores, ACT scores, we're always right at the top. We lead the nation in volunteerism, giving to nonprofits, giving of our time, every measure of civic engagement, arts per capita. We are a special place, and I am lucky to have grown up here and been able to remain here and cover politics here, which keep me optimistic. And I know it's a very hard time to be optimistic, but if anywhere in the country we can be proud of our voters and our electorate, it's here because we show up, because we care, because we get educated, because people on Friday night sit around and watch public television. It's the reason I have a job. And I'll put in a plug tonight, please join us. <laughs> 7 p.m. statewide television, we will have the last gubernatorial debate. We hosted the first gubernatorial debate of the election cycle, and we won the ratings in PBS. You know how, uh -huh. you could say how unique that is. We beat ABC, NBC, Fox, all of them. 
That does not happen in public television, and it doesn't happen anywhere but Minnesota, because all of you care and vote. And what an election we have. Oh, boy. So I've been paying attention to this my entire <laughs> life. And between my father and I, we've been covering Minnesota politics for more than half a century, and neither of us have ever seen an election like this. We have two U.S. Senate seats. That is kind of an accident of history. They're supposed to be staggered, but because of Al Franken's resignation, we have a special election. This is Senator Smith, and she is running against Karen Housley on the Republican side. So we have two U.S. Senate seats. One of them is a special election. We have an open governor's race, and governor's always interesting in our state, so that is open. And because of a whole domino effect, and some of it was because of the governor's race, we had an attorney general who didn't run for attorney general and ran for governor and got knocked out. And we even had a member of Congress who was retiring and then wasn't retiring, and he was running for lieutenant governor and he got knocked out. The dominoes are enormous, and we could talk all day just about that. But beyond our governor's race, then we have four competitive congressional races. Minnesota has eight seats. That's half of our congressional seats are competitive. Nowhere else in the country can say that. The news hour at National PBS in DC suddenly discovered Minnesota this year. <laughs> Just because of that, I've never been on so much, sending them stories, doing live shots, because Minnesota is the center of the political universe right now, in large part because of those four congressional seats, because one of them or two of them may decide control in Washington. We know who the president's gonna be, we do not know what type of Congress the president is going to have. So that could be decided right here in Minnesota, our first, second, eighth, third congressional districts, northern Minnesota, southern Minnesota, southern suburbs, western suburbs. All of those really are up for grabs because polls, you know, polls are a snapshot. I will remind people, polls aren't always wrong. Polls were not even completely wrong two years ago. Polls were not wrong in 1998. The polls are a snapshot of the past. It's what voters in the past were thinking. By the time they come out and the pace of news today, all of those opinions are old. The other thing to watch in polls is trends. It's not just who's ahead. If the margin of error is plus or minus 4% and the spread is 4%, that's virtually tied. We get a little obsessed with the horse racing, who's ahead, who's trajectory is up, whose trajectory is down. That's something I pay a lot of attention to. And most of those races from one of those US Senate seats to all four congressional races all appear pretty close. So that is gonna be fascinating. And then the one other thing I'm paying attention to because I work in our Minnesota State Capitol is our State House is on the ballot, all 134 seats there, and that is up for grabs too. It's been flipping about every two election cycles. So the House is up every two years. So about every four years now, we've been trending on a flip of the House. That could be fascinating. We don't know what party the governor was in, but we've largely had divided government in Minnesota most of the last couple of decades, a governor of one party in a legislature, generally of another party or divided. So Minnesotans are fascinating. I call you the unicorns <laughs> because we actually split tickets. People outside of Minnesota can't believe that there are human beings that go like this on their ballot, and some of you do. And that's why this is a really fun place to cover politics. It um, is indeed. Yeah. So I'm going to talk just ab about a few of the issues that are out there, the trends, um, about the, the political environment, and even more importantly, about governance. Um, President Sullivan, in her introductory comments, said, I can't believe that the election is already next Tuesday. I think most of the people in Minnesota would say, I can't wait for next Tuesday, <laughs> or maybe even better, next Wednesday. Um, and, and I do want to pick up on one thing Mary said. You know, She talked about um, how unusual it is to have both Senate seats up in the, the same year. The last time that happened was 1978, when uh, Senator Dernberger was elected to fill out the last four years of Hubert Humphrey's term. I was on Durenberger's uh, campaign. Um, it'll be 40 years ago next week. So Dave was elected on November 7th. On November 9th, he and I flew out to Washington where, where he was sworn in um, in Howard Baker's office. We walked across the street to Senator Muriel Humphrey's office. And the very first person I met in Washington was a young staff person who had worked for both Senator Hubert and Senator Muriel Humphrey. 
and Libby is still putting up with me today to show you that there is hope for bipartisanship <laughs> even now. Bravo. So let me just talk quickly about a, a couple of issues and, and trends, and then we want to, to turn it over to you. The, the, the first really big issue for the future of Minnesota, I think, is the, this rural-urban divide that has been growing for some time, but has really widened over the, the last couple of years. And I think in many ways, it has implications that are profound, as profound to the future of Minnesota as the national north-south south split has had to, to national politics and, and policy. Just look what has happened over the, the last couple of years. In 2012, you might remember, there was the constitutional amendment um, to, to define marriage as between a, a man and a woman. It was defeated by, by a fairly comfortable margin, but it passed in 76 out of the 87 counties. It was only defeated in 11 of the counties, the metro area and a couple of the college counties. And in many of those rural counties, it passed with more than 70% of the vote. Huge divide in, in terms of, of values. Um, in that same year, in, in uh, 2012, Obama won Minnesota with 53% of the vote. But more significantly, he won 23 counties outside of the, the Twin Cities area and was competitive in another nine counties within 5% of the vote. In 2014, Democrat Mark Dayton won re-election and also won something like 30 rural communities. And then we had 2016. And in 2016, the story really isn't so much that, that Donald Trump came close to winning Minnesota as it is how much Hillary Clinton collapsed in Minnesota. And Donald Trump was within 2,000 votes of the total that Mitt Romney received in, in 2012. Hillary Clinton fell 190,000 votes short of Obama's total. And more than that, almost all of her votes were concentrated in the metro area. She only won or was competitive in one-third of the rural counties that Obama had, had fared well just four years earlier. So think how that plays out, not just for electoral politics, but in terms of issues. Think about housing. Housing is a statewide crisis. And it's not just housing for low-income people, as many in the Twin Cities tend to think of it. It's housing for people who are making good incomes in greater Minnesota, who can't afford to buy a house, can't afford to rent a house in many cases. We think of all of the, the scourge that has been inflicted by the opioid crisis. In rural Minnesota, meth is on the rise and a huge problem. And we're ignoring that to a large extent. It's those kinds of, of issues that profoundly affect the future of Minnesota that this, this rural-urban divide is, is harming. And so now you have the two parties playing to that. Well, the Democratic strategy to win the House of Representatives is almost entirely a suburban strategy. Boy, that's a, a high-risk strategy. I mean, they have to run the table in the suburban districts to win a majority in the House. And so what we're likely left with, because I do think that, that Tim Walls will be elected governor, is another four years of divided government. That makes it challenging to, to get things done. Second point is, remember how we used to complain about the two parties as being Tweedledee and Tweedledum? Anybody think that's true anymore? <laughs> no. We have two parties that, that are moving out to the extremes. We have a, a, a situation, I think, where Bernie Sanders and others are doing to the Democratic Party what the Tea Party did to the Republican Party a few years ago, pushing them farther and farther out to the point where a Harvard study just a year ago said not only is this extremism a problem, but it said, and this is a quote, our political system has become the major barrier to solving nearly every important challenge our nation needs to address. Our political system. Because the whole goal now is to win elections, and you win elections by energizing your base. And that's all the negative advertising that, that we see out there. 
But when you energize your base, you also drive this wedge with the other side of the table. So look at the issue of, of health care. Tim Walls is proposing health reform that largely is based on allowing people to buy into Minnesota care, the so-called public option. Jeff Johnson says, oh no, the answer is we, we ought to trust the marketplace, but in order to protect people who have pre-existing health conditions, we need to go back to something like the, the high-risk pool that Minnesota used to have. Those two proposals don't work without the other side. You can't have people buying into, a high, in, into Minnesota care if you don't have a very robust private marketplace that subsidizes the, the, the public programs. And you can't have a high-risk pool if you're not willing to, to support massive government intervention in the healthcare marketplace. And yet, when, when they discuss those two issues, it's in a way that drives a wedge. How do you get to, to a solution that encompasses either of them? The third is that it's really hard to, to find the middle ground, to break free of this extremism, when all of the arbiters of what is fact and what is nonsense are eroded. Not just the attacks on, on the media, but think about science and how we've undermined science. And it's not just from the right. It's not just the climate deniers. There is an equally large consensus among scientists that genetically modified foods are safe, and there is an equally large group of mostly Democrats, mostly liberals, who deny that. We don't trust science on either side unless it comports with our beliefs. We've got to get over that. We've got to figure out how to engage people in more sources of information, trust in, in more sources of, of information. And so my advice to you and to everyone is if every time you get an email with some information, if every time there's a post that comes to your Facebook news feed causes you to say, I knew that, then you've got a problem. <laughs> <laughs> because you're not that smart, I'm not that smart, even Mary isn't that smart, although she's pretty close. <laughs> you're being targeted. You're being manipulated. We've got to break free of that. We have to make that effort to reach across the aisle and to talk to people who are different from us. That was the whole point of the conversation that St. Thomas hosted yesterday. Have conversations with people who aren't like us and listen to them for a, for, for a change. Um, fourth is that when every issue is uh, framed as a bilateral choice, for or against, you erode innovation. You have no chance to, to get to something new. And so it's great that, that Governor Dayton is going to leave office with the state in much better fiscal health, but we now are at a point where we've exhausted tax capacity among the rich, we have increased spending by 50% over the last eight years, and we still have not solved the achievement gap. We haven't addressed infrastructure problems. We have a health care crisis. We have housing issues that, that have to be resolved. We are not in as good a shape as we should be going forward, and the country's even worse. I mean, we've, we've had this massive increase in spending, the massive tax cuts, and we're not getting anything in return for the future. Nothing to deal with climate change, nothing to deal with the infrastructure, nothing to deal with health policy, and yet we're exhausting all of our resources. That's an intolerable situation. And, and lastly, because I'm at St. Thomas and I was trained at St. Thomas, some optimism. You know, I think there is reason to, to, to be optimistic. Some of it in, in the young people who we see getting involved, some of it in, in um, the, the growing momentum around really meaningful political reforms, ranked choice voting, maybe campaign financing reform, maybe changing how, how we, dis we draw districts. Um, but what's really encouraging is look at all of the innovation that is going on in the private sector, in the not-for-profit sector. Look at all of the innovation that is going on at state and local, gov or at local and county governments. There are some really interesting things in education, healthcare, and environmental protection. 
that, that ought to give us cause for, for optimism. So, a little bit of what we face over the next four years, and now we'd like to uh, open it up to your questions. Good afternoon, thank you for your comments. 2020, we are going to have another census. What is your crystal ball say about what is going to happen? Is Minnesota going to lose a representative? And with the likely political environment right now and who's in charge, how are the districts going to be reapportioned? I, I like that you talk about apportionment because you hear so much about gerrymandering around the country. Do you ever hear it in Minnesota being a problem? It's not. Do you know who draws our lines in Minnesota? Legally, politicians are supposed to draw the lines. But practically, practically <laughs> they never do. So it goes to our courts. And this is one of the reasons courts matter, because our courts in Minnesota have remained largely independent and nonpartisan. And that's why we have four out of eight of our congressional boundaries incredibly competitive. And that is why our state House of Representatives is incredibly competitive, because of that nonpartisan judiciary that's drawing really safe lines or unsafe lines, right. I shall say. Right. And when you say 2020, immediately my radar says, Amy Klobuchar, maybe for president. She is moving up the list of possible presidential candidates, and we will be keeping a very close eye on that. I believe CNN just moved her from about ninth to sixth after the Kavanaugh hearings. Definitely made some people hate her more, but it made some people like her more, raised her profile. I mean, she's been depicted on Saturday Night Live. Which she wasn't watching live. Yeah. And she you know, denies and says she's going to fulfill her term. But I think it'll be interesting to see once again if Minnesota has a presidential candidate in the mix. So two points on, on redistricting. The first, when I talked about the, the rural-urban divide, for more than 50 years, from the early part of the 1900s till the mid-1960s, there was no redistricting in Minnesota. Why? because the rural legislators, their caucus was strong enough to block the, the redistricting, and they could see, obviously, that it was the urban areas that were gaining in population. And so it wasn't until the courts finally ordered it in the mid-1960s to say, you gotta do this, and then we saw the, the transition. And secondly, as Mary pointed out, in four out of the last five cycles, the, the courts have had to, to draw the, the new boundaries uh, because the, the legislative plan was rejected. The only time that the legislative plan was accepted was when Governor Carlson thought he had vetoed the Democratic bill, and in fact, the court said, oh no, you didn't, you were late with, with that. Um, right. So, so you know, I do think that, that in Minnesota, it is important. Uh, uh, there are some good alternatives, bipartisan alternatives that, that have been um, proposed. And, and I'm a strong believer that legislators and, and members of Congress should not be choosing their own voters. It's the voters that ought to choose who represents them. And another part, if I could follow up on that question too, is will we lose a member of Congress? Oh, yeah, and yeah, we yeah. are right on the bubble. It, yeah. could, it could go either way. What you have noticed, one of the reasons some of those congressional districts in northern Minnesota and southern Minnesota have gotten more competitive, especially northern Minnesota, is because they keep dipping down into the exurbs. They have to grab population. We're still growing in the exurbs and right. suburbs. And we are growing in urban areas, but that's not politically competitive, Minneapolis, St. Paul. So if you look at a map, if you go Google a map, over time you'll see the seventh and the eighth from northern Minnesota swinging further and further into the metro to pick up population. And for what it's worth, our state demographer, at least right now, believes that we will still have eight seats come, come um, the, the next cycle, 2020. Um, not so much because the big states aren't gaining, but because the states we compete with are falling faster than Minnesota. What is your prediction for the attorney general race and the impact Th that, of that we the get over it and we never have to deal <laughs> with it again? <laughs> you know? And what impact at all will Ellison <laughs> Canacy have on the uh, ticket as a whole? I thought the Star Tribune's editorial. If you saw the Star Tribune this morning, they said exactly what what I've been feeling, and that is, this is a race that doesn't deserve endorsement. These are two hugely flawed candidates. And, and I think it is so reflective of, of where the parties are at that, that they are going to put up candidates who, for very, very different reasons, obviously, I, I think just represent a lot of what is bad about Minnesota politics. Um, and, and so I have no idea who's going to win. I just find it amazing that, and I've never seen anything quite like this, 
that in the last Minnesota poll, the Republican Doug Wardlow was leading that race by seven or eight points. He's not known by nearly six out of 10 voters. <laughs> I mean, I've never seen a, as strong an anti-vote as that. It was an anti-vote. And then the latest poll out today, ha this is KSTP yeah. shows, the Democrat now ahead, Ellison ahead right. slightly, but again, it's within the margin of error, so we consider that race essentially tied. It's a tough one. I think reporters, especially after two years ago's election cycle, have hopefully learned not to make predictions because we'll be wrong. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen in that race. Uh -huh. I do suspect we're going to see a significant drop off from people who just don't want to vote yeah. in that. I think we'll see a lot of numbers posted, U.S. Senate and governor. This is a statewide race. And I have a feeling a lot of folks just say ick on both and, and want to hop over. They, they do come from both the extremes of the base. And it was a, a situation of where the, the moderate or the average constituent wasn't listened to. And it was interesting, yesterday, Democrats had to get out to vote, big launch, and Ellison was not there. Yeah. Um, Wardlow has had surrogates doing press conferences all week, and he's not there. I think they're terrified of putting either of them in front of the media right now. For good reason. Yeah, so who, uh, who you, knows you, in that you, one? You, wow. you know, and you just, I mean, the, the challenge of reading the polls is, is compounded this year because you just don't know the impact of Donald Trump on, on, on this race. And what is he going to do over the next four days? And how is that going to affect the, the, the outcome on both sides of the aisle? So just one example, two years ago, now Grand Rapids is, is one of the rural communities that is not doing as, as well as many others. I mean, it hasn't recovered in, in a lot of ways. Two years ago, when, when Republicans did their generic ballot, would you vote for a Republican or would you vote for a Democrat? That district was a minus one Republican, slightly to the, the left, slightly favoring Democrats. Republican Sandy Lehman won that seat largely because of, of Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Today, that's a plus 14 Republican district in two years. That's the Trump I I influence. So how does that play out? You know, w what happens in all of these suburban legislative races where most of the, the, the most vulnerable Republican seats in, in the suburbs are held by women? And many of them, you know, very good candidates and, and highly regarded in their districts and good legislators. That's the, the, the risk of the Democrats running this, this suburban-only strategy when you have to run the table and you have to defeat the likes of Sarah Anderson in Minnetonka or Jennifer Loon in, in Eden Prairie to win the majority of the House, that's a pretty high bar. The other thing, too, when you look at geography, as you were talking about, Trump did really well in rural America, rural Minnesota. But right now, when we start diving into the polls, he's playing very differently in northern Minnesota versus southern Minnesota. Yeah. He's very popular, more popular than ever. And remember, this, you, this is mining territory. Our Democratic Party is called the Democratic Farmer Labor. Labor used to be huge. Democrats used to dominate northern Minnesota. Trump and Republicans have made huge inroads in northern Minnesota. And the steel tariffs and his stance on mining has only helped Republicans. The Democrat is down in the poll. So interesting in that rural area, Trump, Republicans gaining a lot. But when you look at southern Minnesota, another one of our too close to call congressional races, there you have a lot of pork farmers and soybean farmers, and they are not happy with the tariffs. The, the Trump tariffs there are hurting farmers, and he, his approval is on the decline, and the Democrat is looking a little better there than the Republican. So it's, it, you can't even say, this is how rural Minnesota feels about it, because it depends. Our voters are that smart and engaged to say, oh, steel tariffs work here. Yeah. Oh, soybean tariffs, not so much. So it, it's localized. So Ryan is giving us a sign that there's time for one more question. If, if there's another question out there, um, and, and if there is, while well, we're, we're waiting. You know, I think one of the, the, the problems we have, and we'll get to that question, just look at, at the second congressional district, Angie Craig and, and Jason Lewis. One of the attacks on Angie Craig coming from the Republicans is that she supported this tax break for medical device companies. And they're vicious in their attack on Angie Craig. The neighboring district, that very same tax is the centerpiece of Eric Paulson's legislative agenda. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how do you govern if those are the kinds of campaigns that, that we're running? Last question. Can you speak to the outside money that's... Can you speak to the, all the money that's coming in from the outside that's fueling all these 
uh, ads that are just ridiculous. Yeah, in, in, in a word appalling, um, in another word horrendous, um, divisive, I mean, you, you, you use your pejorative. But, but, but look, I, I think that it is going to be very, very hard to control the money coming in. I think there are some things that we ought to do to make it more transparent, to have immediate reporting, to make sure we know where the, the money is coming from. I think all of, of those things would help. But overturning Citizens United is, is very hard. Here's, here's a news bulletin. You cannot change the Constitution through executive order. <laughs> Not everybody knows that. I'm trying. <laughs> it's a laborious process, as it should be. But there are other things, and, and Citizens United r really kind of opened the floodgates, but it wasn't the beginning. I mean, we've seen money pouring into campaigns um, from, from interest groups for, for decades, literally, since the mid-70s. I, I think, though, that, that the answer really is in this room. Turn off the negative ads. You know? Do your own research. Support some of the reforms that would bring better candidates, more diverse candidates, and create more um, informed, educational, thoughtful campaigns like ranked choice voting. Support some finance reform. Make it easier for candidates who don't have wealth, who aren't well connected, but who have great ideas to be candidates. I think it's those kinds of, of activities that would be the, the antidote to, to the big money. And I have a really super simple solution. Watch public television. There you go. <laughs> yeah. I think we're out of time. Yeah, you've been <laughs> terrific. Thank you very much. <laughs>